Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about recovery and the media, addiction and treatment in entertainment and the news. Joining us in our panel today are Mark Weber, Director of Communications, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Ron Tenenbaum, President and Co-Founder, InTheRooms.com, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Dr. W. Douglas Evans, Professor and Director, Public Health Communication and Marketing Program, George Washington University, Washington, D.C. Sandra De Castro Buffington, Director, Hollywood Health and Society, USC Annenberg Norman Lear Center, Beverly Hills, California. The media obviously influences how people create their opinions about, particularly about addiction and treatment issues and behavioral health. And Doug, why don't we review what we mean about media today? Some time ago, Marshall McLuhan said that the medium is the message, and um, uh, that is uh, more true today than ever. Uh, media have proliferated, and uh, they now permeate our society. We're surrounded by it constantly, 24-7, and users increasingly are defining what the media are and uh, uh, what those uh, media mean to the rest of us. And Mark, why is it important for the media to to really understand addiction treatment and behavioral health? I think as Doug just said, it's 24-7. People rely on the media to get their information. And, and as the, 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 the media are reaching out, people are forming opinions, ideas, attitudes about what they think about addiction, mental illness, based on what they're seeing on these TV shows or hear, seeing on the internet, hearing on the radio. So if, if they hear, is accurate, they'll be forming accurate opinions and, and able to help themselves or help other people who are dealing with these issues. If they hear inaccurate information, it proliferates stigma, the discrimination, and, and, and all the unfortunate circumstances people with addictions or mental illness find themselves in as a result of miscommunication. So Sandra, th they definitely do play a role and 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 helping people shape their understanding about issues, particularly addiction and behavioral health? They really do that. And as Mark said, um, actually nearly two-thirds of regular viewers of television report learning something new about a disease or how to prevent it from scripted television shows. Nearly one-third of those viewers take action on what they learn. So if the information's accurate, we're doing them a service. If it's inaccurate, it's a huge disservice. Uh, we also know that over half, 52% of regular viewers, believe that the health content they see on television is accurate. And nearly, I'd say, 26% of those viewers report television shows among their top three sources of health information. Moving on to Ron. Ron, uh, how are substance use disorders and behavioral health issues portrayed in the media? I think the uh, addiction is portrayed accurately. I don't think the recovery of addiction is portrayed accurately. I think it's always uh, the addiction ready for the other shoe to drop and show all the, the worst things about addiction and not the assets of recovery. And of course, um, Doug, we're dealing with so many types of, of, of media here. There's television, there's radio, there are movies. Which one do you think it, it, it really uh, is, is one of the more uh, larger culprits of misrepresenting? I think that uh, while there's so much talk about social media and social networking and the use of the internet, television is still the number one used medium. Mm -hmm. The number of hours of TV time is still the single greatest uh, use of any medium uh, as reported by uh, the Pew studies that have been done in recent years. So clearly TV has a disproportionate influence on our perceptions and attitudes about uh, recovery. Are you including cable in, in there as Absolutely. well? Absolutely, yes. I mean, uh, the cable penetration in this country has reached very high percentages at this point. Most Americans are getting their TV either through satellite or cable or some similar uh, form of feed. So Mark, we've established that accurate depictions help 
and get people to take actions. Inaccurate depictions, let's focus a little bit more on inaccurate since um, Ron has mentioned that uh, overwhelmingly we still see some inaccurate depictions. What does it do for individuals in recovery or what does it do for individuals who need to get into recovery to see inaccurate depictions? Well, I think the inaccurate depictions have continued to perpetuate some of the myths around addiction and mental illness. And, and in terms of recovery, a, a key component is making those social connections, seeing people like yourself, how they succeed, what they do to uh, achieve greatness in life. And, and when, when inaccurate stories are portrayed, it leads people maybe a little bit of doubt instead of hope. And, and that, that's not what's needed at this point in time in their lives. So as opposed to pointing out as much, you know, when there are inaccuracies, what we have done is establish some great working relationships with organizations that, that work with the media to help uh, portray accurate per, or portrayal so that, so that the correct stories are getting out versus perpetuating the myths. But Ron, what does it do to you as a person in recovery personally? Uh, in terms of when you see something that, that doesn't accurately depict who you are and what you're about? I think it hurts the recovery movement and me personally because people have an image of what an addict is. They really don't have an image what recovery is. They think an addict is still that person living under the bridge or a person push, pushing that the grocery cart in the streets of the city aimlessly and nowhere to go. Um, recovery is an asset. It's not a liability anymore. And I think they really depict the liability part of the addiction. But Sandra, it's really difficult. Uh, I know because we do public service announcements and we're forever catching ourselves. And we're in the business of presenting the best possible light on individuals in recovery and on the addiction and treatment field. So. In essence, the individuals that are uh, developing programs, that are putting stories together, do really need to get some kind of insight and expertise, correct? Uh, that's such a great point. Um, Hollywood Health and Society works with uh, scriptwriters and producers to get accurate health portrayals into television, film, and new media. So one thing we're doing, uh, going back to the earlier conversation, we're using a transmedia approach old and new media so that when we do get an accurate TV health storyline on addiction, we then work with a group like SAMHSA to develop the script for a PSA and at dramatic plot points during that storyline refer viewers to credible sources of information through web links or call in hotline numbers. A lot of times we refer viewers to websites where they can actually generate their own content and tell their own stories and have a conversation with other people in similar situations. And often these messages go viral, and then it really takes off around the world. So that's, that's one approach. Uh, but Hollywood Health and Society has a partnership with the Writers Guild of America West. And we work with writers to connect them to experts. So we could take a recovering addict or alcoholic in to meet with the writers. We might take uh, a physician, a clinician, or a researcher and we do a one-hour briefing. Now it's our job, or our experts' jobs, or our recovering person's jobs, to inspire the writers. They're looking for story ideas, and the way we, have, we inspire them is through telling real stories of real people, and case studies. This is what inspires, and then they spin the story. Doug, I wanna talk to you about your expertise is in branding, Mm -hmm. and health branding at that. Mm -hmm. How do we turn the, begin to turn this around? How do, we, how do we take the whole notion of people's per incorrect perceptions about mm -hmm. addiction, about people in recovery, and what steps do we need to begin to, to think about in terms of presenting a positive light? And I mean that in the context of the messaging. Mm -hmm. I think one of the key things is to think about the competition. You know, any strong brand is based on a keen understanding of what it's competing against, what negative messages, negative stereotypes it's competing against. And so how can we reframe the issue of recovery 
So that it's an issue about social benefit, about uplifting of the individual, about economic benefit for society. How can we take some of those aspects of recovery and reframe the debate around how should we treat people in recovery in this society, people who have been addicted and are improving their lives or moving on to a new and better stage of their lives? How can we make that a social benefit and recognize that this is something we need to invest in and this is something that uh, we as a society can collectively benefit from, not just the person in recovery, but all of us can benefit from. What's the group benefit? Good. Well, when we come back, I want to continue along this vein and really get into how we do that and help people create a framework for doing it. We'll be right back. SAMHSA's tried to do a lot to encourage the media and the entertainment industry to do the right thing in the way they uh, portray um, substance use disorders, the way they portray mental illness, the way they portray people with those issues, and the way they portray people in recovery. We do that by providing awards to people uh, and to the industry for doing it right, and we also try to call them. Um, call them, meaning call them out when they do it incorrectly. Sometimes it's, um, I think, done inadvertently. And so educating, I think, is important, and we try to do that. When we see um, a new movie or a new television show or something portraying uh, these issues in an in incorrect way, we like to try to get a hold of the producers or a hold of the people who are doing it and let them know that that's not a good way to do it and not acceptable. So both the carrot and stick approach and uh, also trying to work with advocacy communities around the country when they do those things as well and providing data and providing information the best way that we can. One of the things an audience can do is to demand from local media as well as national media and cable uh, an accurate assessment of the situation. Uh, there's a tendency to romanticize the um, issues because uh, there are times when the media does romanticize the tragic figure and the person who is an alcoholic or the person who is a drug addict uh, can be the quintessential tragic figure. The issue that the media has is how do I describe the life of a person in recovery? Uh, I want to describe that life as just as uh, vital, just as active, just as uh, interesting as somebody who's never had an alcohol or drug problem. I don't want to they portray a person in recovery as a, a tragic figure. Uh, I want to be able to make it clear that indeed that here's a person, because that is the no notion of recovery, it's not mere abstinence, it is embracing wellness and health that and the portrayal needs to be one of wellness and health. Treat me. Treat me with understanding. Treat me. Treat me with courtesy. Drug and alcohol addiction is an equal opportunity disease. Individuals in recovery come from all walks of life and deserve to be treated with respect and admiration for winning one of the hardest battles there is. Treat me without judgment. Treat me with humanity. Alcohol and drug addiction deserves proper treatment. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. People trapped by drug or alcohol addiction often feel like there's no hope, no way out. But for every lock, there's a key. And if you have a problem, it's good to know there are real solutions to help you get free. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. How I pay it forward is every day I have a recovering family. My wife is in long-term recovery. We have two children, 19 and 17, that we have to role model today, not tell them how to live, but show them how we lead our lives. They've never seen us pick up a drink or a drug in our life. Uh, they think recovery is an asset rather than a liability. I sponsor 17 men in recovery and try to role model who I am to them. 
And, uh, and now I'm involved with InTheRooms.com, and we have over 80,000 members that uh, I'm grateful to for being on our site. And we're growing every day by hundreds of people. And um, it's not only getting people together, keeping them connected, but we're saving lives every day. So Sandra, how can information about addiction treatment and recovery be portrayed in the media? Well, there, there's so many different ways. Uh, when we talk with writers at the Writers Guild of America West, they tell us that their agenda is to tell compelling stories. So we need to inspire them with real stories of real people, positive stories. So for example, um, last year, our Sentinel for Health Award winner was private practice, the um, Abby's alcoholism story. I don't know if you saw that one, but it was an, a wonderful portrayal of a professional woman. You know, she's uh, very, she's an MD, she's very well respected in her field. She's an alcoholic and having a problem. And she actually goes into treatment, comes out, goes back to work, and eventually has a relapse. So this episode was, a, was about relapse. One thing we know about um, portrayals of alcoholism and drug addiction in television comes from our TV monitoring project. Um, we did an analysis of shows, um, 800 shows from, no, it's almost 1,000 shows from 2004 to 2006. And what we found were that 29% of these episodes um, portrayed drug use, and 33% of them portrayed alcoholism. Only 6% of those alcoholism storylines actually talked about alcohol abuse or alcohol as a problem. So one thing we know is that people are actually seeing people drinking and taking drugs on, on screen um, and not as much uh, discussion about intervention, treatment, and recovery. So it's really important that we inspire writers with stories of recovery. Mm -hmm. And Doug, you know, there, there are some, as Ron has said, as Mark has mentioned, there's also the other coin uh, where stories really do portray it uh, in a very uh, negative light and actually encourage that. Isn't that true? Oh, uh, I think that's definitely true. I think, uh, you know, I think one of the, the big issues here in terms of how we portray recovery is uh, to you know, think about consistency of message from the messenger. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't be both a good cop and a bad cop. Um, I think that we can have good cops, and I think Sandra uh, gave an example of that kind of an approach. And by good cop, I mean taking a positive approach to trying to change behavior, to try to influence public opinion, as opposed to fear appeals, negative messaging, uh, negative portrayals that uh, are using a different kind of strategy that are trying to basically scare people straight, if you will, uh, or scare them into changing their behavior. Uh, I think that those messages have to be um, developed carefully and they can't necessarily come from the same messenger. So I think we need to keep that in mind. Well, I know, Mark, that we work also uh, with not only um, Hollywood Health and Society, but the Entertainment Industries Council. And they just finished having their uh, PRISM Awards to laud the, the gains made by some of the programs as well. Um, but also EIC helps us to, you know, intervene sometimes to, to help us to talk to the pro also the producers and the writers about how to positively portray, particularly those shows. I know that we've worked with Grey's Anatomy and uh, Brothers and Sisters and many others. Uh, but in, there are those shows, however, uh, in cable, there are some shows um, that I've seen, you know, that really take the addiction to, to its extreme, almost portraying it and glamorizing it. Right. And, and, you know, one of the key things is, you know, we love the media. They're such a powerful tool in our ability to get out accurate messages. And at the same time, the media is there to entertain. And, and there's a creative process that goes into creating storylines. and and when a storyline gets off or could potentially be doing more harm than good, one of the great things about the recovery community and the treatment community is they're willing to pick up the phone and say, let's sit down and talk about you know, what the implications of this show are and, and how it might be impacting people in recovery and, and how they feel about themselves and how they interact with society. And, and quite frankly, every time that I've seen that happen, 
the writers, they've been open to the conversation. They may not change the storyline. They definitely don't go back and revise what has happened, but they're open. We set up the conversation. And I would say most of the times we come out with a more productive approach to the storyline in the future. Ron, as a person in recovery, do you watch with that eagle eye and do you take action? And do, would you encourage other people in recovery to do that, as Mark has noted? Yes. <laughs> I, I do watch with an eagle eye. We were just uh, speaking about a storyline where um, it's always about picking up that next drink or taking that next drug after getting clean or sober in treatment. I, I rarely, if ever, see the success story about recovery where that person goes through treatment and comes out, goes to meetings, has a regular family life, struggles, but has choices and makes those choices by the use of what we do in recovery, by asking people for help and doing the right things and going to a meeting or picking up the phone and they don't pick up the drink. You don't have to pick up a drink. You can go to a meeting, you can talk to somebody and see how much better your life gets and, and the success in recovery rather than always that struggle. And how would you exalt other individuals in recovery, other people in recovery to, to really get engaged in this dialogue? Because really what we're talking about here is how do we create a different mindset in society about people in recovery through portraying uh, addiction recovery in a positive light and, and in a positive and I, I think you've mentioned it in a realistic light I think that you know it doesn't have to be all pink and rosy I mean people can have relapse because people in real life have relapse but indeed as you have mentioned you know uh, brothers and sisters I have to tell you did it did um, the youngest uh, of, of, of the brother and sister cohort had a problem uh, when he came back from uh, service abroad and comes in and, and he relapsed and they handled it quite well. I think they did win, you know, one of the PRISM Awards because of that. And, and how would you let people in recovery know how important it is for them to get engaged and get involved? Well, I think that it has to be a story of hope and there is life after addiction. Um, how I would get it is, uh, you know, now that I'm sitting here thinking is I'm going to do it on InTheRooms.com, uh, the mass membership of people in recovery to get involved and to watch these shows and to make comments and to respond to what they see right and to respond to what they see that is inaccurate. Writers do listen to audience comments. So if viewers, you know, disagree or are concerned about something and they write to writers and producers, they, they talk to us all the time about the feedback they get. It is heard. That's really important. The other thing uh, one recovering addict said to us, we had a panel discussion at the Writers Guild in January, and we brought together experts in recovery, people in recovery, and about 100 writers. And one recovering addict said, the thing that bugs him the most, he also happens to be a writer, the thing that bugs him the, the most is seeing portrayals of AA meetings on television that show these bored, depressed people holding styrofoam cups. He said, if meetings were that dreary, who would go? He said, the meetings I go to are raucous, they're full of dark humor, they're stories of people who are surviving and even thriving. He said, that's why we go to meetings, and he wants that change. I thought that was really insightful. Those are the kinds of things we need. And that's why we take recovering addicts into the writers' rooms to meet with them and to, to tell them how it really is. Doug, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, as we know, the Internet has many positive and negative ways that, that it can be used. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how the Internet has contributed to both a positive and a negative uh, uh, perspective on, on addiction treatment. Well, one obvious way that the Internet has contributed in a positive way is it gives us a place to go to get more information. So if through the PSAs that are being put out, if through um, programming that's got a positive message around recovery and uh, recovery from addiction, you can then go someplace and you can actually get useful information, actionable information. You can engage, you can interact with a community of people who have similar uh, concerns, similar problems. You can actually be part of a community in a way that you never could before. So that's a huge, obvious benefit. The, the downside is that any opinion 
on the subject is fair game. Any opinion, whether it be pro-substance use, uh, techniques for substance abuse, um, uh, anything you can think of uh, that could reinforce um, not only the, the behaviors that we're hoping to change, but also negative stereotypes about addiction. Uh, all of that's out there too. Uh, and you know, which side is winning uh, that competition? That's very hard to say. And uh, we'll see in the years ahead. Well, when we come back, I want to talk about more how media outlets can do better. And we want to help them to do a better job by what you will be saying here. We'll be right back. It's important to be familiar with the proper terminology surrounding addiction and recovery. One of the terms you'll want to be familiar with is stigma. Stigma is the prejudice and discrimination associated with substance use and mental health disorders. Stigma serves as a barrier for individuals and their family members in regards to seeking and receiving treatment. For more information on this and other recovery jargon, visit the Recovery Month website. When you have a drug or alcohol problem, your whole world stops making sense. You can get help for yourself or a loved one and make sense of life again. For information, treatment referral, and most importantly, help. Call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The Entertainment Industries Council was formed 28 years ago, and it was formed to bring the power and influence of the entertainment industry to bear on health and social issues. It engages writers, producers, directors, executives, uh, all within the entertainment industry as well as talent in the industry to basically harness their creative talents and the reach of the entertainment industry to touch the consumer, the general public, and the regular audiences that are watching television, going to movies, and listening, listening to music. All of the photos, you have separated them out and really yeah. cleaned them up from the picture this meeting. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be using some of those for the publication. So, Christina, if you... Picture if this could, is a meeting that we convene. It's a very interesting process where we bring representatives from the entertainment industry, maybe a TV show writer or someone involved in uh, medical research, uh, producers, directors, oftentimes talent, and we have them explain their world to the constituent groups, to the stakeholders that are concerned about treatment and recovery. How can the entertainment industry most appropriately picture what treatment and recovery looks like? Because when they produce a show, that depicts these topics, their audiences start to get a better understanding and a connection. What's happened is that there's been vocabulary, language, you know, words are empty boxes until you fill them and define them. There's been language that's been now acceptable and there's been portrayals of, of situations in life that show up in shows uh, that are addressing substance abuse and mental health. That starts to take the edge off of and the secrecy behind being willing to talk about and address uh, a substance abuse or mental health issue that's occurring in, a, in an individual's life, in the life of the viewer. You know, you forget when you're in Hollywood and you're like in this little bubble that there's a lot of passion around these areas. And to, when you are able to plug into that passion, you bring that passion back with you. And, um, and that's just really nice to like, to like, you know, just remember your audience, remember um, you know, what we're aiming for. Episodes of some of these primetime dramas reach an audience of nearly 15 million people 
every week who will record the, the episode if they're going to miss it or buy the DVD with the full season because of that affinity. And the more people can relate to these stories, the more they will seek treatment because they will not feel stigmatized. They will realize that it's treatable and that there certainly is hope and opportunity in recovery. Welcome to the 12th Annual PRISM Awards, a showcase of entertainment making a difference. Presented by the Entertainment Industries Council Incorporated in collaboration with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And the the Entertainment Industries Council has, um, has really been very fortunate in uh, our ability to partner with SAMHSA on a number of different projects. The uh, PRISM Awards is probably the most high profile project that we do at SAMHSA. It's a good collaboration because our goals are very compatible, getting sound information to the general public on the areas of treatment, addiction, recovery, and also in the area of mental health. I, I've never struggled with anything myself, but I do know from delving into this man, Owen Hunt, who deals, who is dealing with his, his, you know, disorder that there is a lot of hope and there's a lot there's a, it's 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 not a thing you're stuck with it's a thing that is a journey it's part of a journey and um, it might be hard sometimes but it's it's definitely if you if you take the right steps and it, everything is is surmountable I think as we all were working on Crazy Heart we knew men and women who had struggled with addiction we can't really know what that's like, how hard it is, but we used in inspiration from friends and family members that we all knew and uh, know that you can, you can change your life. Bottom line, this is not a short-term process. The minute these types of programming and this type of thrust vanishes, so does the effect that the media has on this issue. So we're in it for the long haul, and the entertainment industry is in it for the long haul. And a lot of the creative people that we've been working with over the years now are in it for the long haul. And we all recognize that change does not come overnight. So I think you're going to see you know, a very consistent and ongoing participation from the entertainment industry at various levels. Mark, talk to us about how SAMHSA gets engaged and involved in, in the, all these issues. Well, part of that is you know, SAMHSA has made public awareness and support around addiction, prevention, mental illness one of its top priorities. Rarely do you see a federal agency that identifies communications as a top priority. That means we need to be part, communications needs to be part of everything that is coming out of the agency. So we'll be involved in things from the development of treatment programs and grants and, and products to continuing our support as, as an integral part recovery month as, as part of SAMHSA's public awareness and support initiative. And indeed, that is one of um, Pamela Hyde's 10 strategic initiatives, isn't that? It's very impressive. Yes, it's, it's, we have 10 strategic initiatives that are being used to align the agency's resources around the top priorities, and the 10th priority is public awareness and support. You know, one of the issues that we haven't included in the whole issue of media is, is the music uh, industry and, and its role. Uh, Ron, what would you say about that? I think the music industry plays a large role in how they can portray addiction and recovery. Um, I listen to some of the music my kids listen to, uh, you know, rap music. Um, some of it's great, I like some of it, but a lot of it, the words are horrible. It portrays drug use and sexual abuse. And, but then on the other hand, I have great songs that I listen to about recovery, success stories in recovery. Uh, Aerosmith's Amazing. Um, Richie Supa, who wrote Amazing, also wrote In the Rooms. It won the PRISM Award in 2009, which is fantastic. And there's so many musicians in recovery well, today. Well, Nikki Six, Nikki Six did a whole album, right, Mark? Absolutely. Right, and, and Richie Supa's putting out an album now with dozens of recovering musicians from different groups that we've all heard of since the 70s and and they're they're producing it now and they're all written about recovery and all the success stories that go with it so essentially so we've got the internet and in the internet we didn't even begin to touch on the whole issue of pharmacies uh, online pharmacies and how they contribute right mark 
the, the internet is incredibly valuable in terms of the information it provides, access to unlimited resources, and, and with free trade, commerce, and opinion, and speech, you know, there, are, there are people who take advantage of opportunities and, and uh, perpetuate some of the, the less uh, fortunate sides of our society. And, and our approach, again, is to reward when people do things in an accurate way, make sure that the, the portrayal is being recognized so that, so that ultimately somebody would never think of portraying someone in recovery sitting you know, under a bridge and, and or someone who is, has an addiction, but because that would be you know, just not the cool way to do it. And, and so one step at a time, one program at a time, one writer at a time is the way we eventually will turn this around. Doug, why should the in these industries care as to how they portray this issue? In the long term, it's in their best interest. I mean, I think you can look at some recent examples uh, of global uh, corporations recognizing that working in the public health interest is really in their long-term interest. I mean, the, the most obvious current example is the food industry. You know, um, they ha run the risk of being the next tobacco industry if they're portrayed as being culpable in uh, obesity and childhood obesity. And I think you see in recent years that they're recognizing that. Uh, a number of food corporations have recently formed a, a, a foundation uh, that's focused on obesity prevention. Now, certainly part of that is, uh, you know, um, uh, corporate marketing uh, on their part, um, but there's definitely a corporate social responsibility uh, aspect as well. And I think if we can um, seek to harness that in the substance abuse prevention and re uh, recovery field, if we can take advantage of that and, and put that the power of that need that many corporations have to uh, not only be good citizens but uh, uh, appear to be good citizens, uh, I think we can we can make some mileage out of that. And in the meantime, um, we can also appeal directly to the creative community, to writers, even if they don't care uh, f about issues of social good, they do care about their own writing and they care about making their stories compelling. And the way to make them more compelling is to make them more realistic. So if we can get some of the perspectives in that Ron was describing and make it real, portray recovery and a good life and AA meetings in a realistic way as a, a really cool place to be and an amazing way to live, we get better portrayals. Ron, give us a picture of what they're really like. Oh, they're fantastic. <laughs> Um, meetings uh, are social events that are serious during the meeting, but we have what we call the meeting before, then uh, people getting together and getting their coffee and getting settled and hugging each other and loving each other. These are people that have been together for 20, 25, sometimes 30 years and supporting each other. Then the meeting where there is no talking, we listen to whatever discussions or speakers. And after the meeting, we usually grab a gang of people and go out to eat and have, or have some coffee together and what we call fellowship. Um, it's a great way to live. You know, that, uh, it's much better than living in addiction. I mean, there is no comparison for me. And, you know, people always, uh, everyone knew when I was an addict. Everyone knew that I was high. No one said anything. And so now that I'm in recovery, I don't want to hide that. You know, I'm proud of being in recovery, and I don't have to hide behind that uh, I'm not in recovery. So That's excellent. Mark, let's talk a little bit about co-occurring conditions. Co-occurring conditions. Yes. Um, well, quite often when we, we are portraying stories about individuals in the media, it's not all so clean cut. It's not just an addiction or a mental illness. There's usually involves addiction, mental illness, maybe even heart disease, some kind of condition that uh, per, or it's contributing to what is going on in the storyline. And, and, and quite frankly, when, when, you, when you begin to develop interesting storylines or, or lyrics, um, sometimes the, when you get down to the basic issue, it is an underlying mental illness or, or addiction, and, and showing how those multiple conditions all contribute to what is going on in that individual's life quite often creates a very interesting story. And, and, and so as, as the media portrays addiction, they also need to look at all the other things that are going on in an individual's life, how it contributes to resolving the problem and how it contributes to 
the problem itself. And SAMHSA is helping individuals that are through the media. You mentioned a few initiatives that we have. You want to mention them again? We do a number of things. I mean, between public service advertising, working with the Advertising Council, we do outreach with Entertainment Industry Council, we work with Hollywood Health and Society. What we want to do is we want to take the, the resources the federal government has, the science that we have behind the information, make sure that those, those storylines are credible, because if they're not credible and not believable, you know, we, we lose our entree into the audience to begin with. And, and so what can we do to support those who are in recovery, getting the story out? What can we do to help those who are working with the industry get the accurate information out? And what can we do to just overall raise awareness amongst the public about addictions and mental illnesses so that, so that people are informed, they can take steps early on, not wait until the train wreck happens in, in somebody's life. So again, get, getting treating mental illnesses and addictions a lot like any other health condition. I, intervene early, let's, let's, let's help the person into recovery quickly. Sandra. Um, I want to refer to Mark's comment about getting the information out. Mm -hmm. One thing we know from research is that um, there's a factor in storytelling on television, film, and new media that's called transportation. It's really a measure of the level of engrossment. So if there's a very compelling story, and of course Hollywood writers are among the master storytellers of the world, people lose their surroundings, they forget what time it is, they come to see the characters as their family or friends, they care deeply what happens to them. This is being transported and in that state of transportation people are much more open to learning. They have much higher knowledge gains. So in getting the, the information out, as Mark said, if it is an integral part of a very compelling story, people will learn more. And this is why it's so critical that the writers and the producers be knowledgeable yes. about addiction treatment because the only way to do that is if they, they're armed with that information. Correct, Sandra? It's correct. And one example is uh, on the CW network, the show 90210, which is a show for young, young people. Um, they did a six-week story arc on bipolar disorder among youth. And Hollywood Health and Society consulted on that. We had a psychiatrist consult um, the show actually sent us the script ahead of time. And in fact, they sent us the rough edits. So we sat with a psychiatrist in our office for a second round to review every episode, which is very rare for a network to do. Um, and they did an excellent job. We then collaborated with SAMHSA to develop a public service announcement. We got permission, and SAMHSA helped us develop the script. And this PSA featured this gorgeous young actress who was the woman with bipolar disorder in the story referring young people to a special landing page, a website. And it, we, had, we tracked the traffic. There were huge spikes the day of the show and the day after this uh, PSA aired. And kids actually could, could enter discussion threads. And there were some really heartbreaking stories in there. Kids who said, I've been telling my parents for two years there's something wrong with me. Now I know I have bipolar disorder. They don't believe me. Well, in this case, it was one of SAMHSA's partner groups. They had trained therapists in the discussion group who could actually refer kids to help. Very good. And when we come back, we're going to be talking a little bit more about media literacy and how the general public can get engaged. We'll be right back. For more information on National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month, events in your town, and how you can get involved, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Mornings used to be the toughest. Before I got treatment for my addiction, it was the little things that were hardest to bear. But now that I'm free of drugs and alcohol, it's the little things that give me the most joy. Recovery. It gave me back my life. Now I can give back. For drug and alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. The mission of our nonprofit Getting Them Sober Foundation is 
simply to help re-educate families of alcoholics and the mental health profession so that they can better effectively get more people into treatment and save lives. She can see the consequences of her disease, that kind of thing. Um, what we're working on now is helping both mental health professionals and the media who mean well. They really want to help, but they call families spouses of alcoholics enablers. And that just makes them feel ashamed and they drop out of treatment. What, I, we, what we're suggesting instead is that they use the word rescuers. That's such a nice word. It's a kind word. And people go, oh, yeah, I'm a rescuer. Too many times we hear the newly sober alcoholic or addict. They come back after a relapse and they say, I wouldn't have gone out that time if I hadn't been enabled. And that's one of the really bad things about using the word enabler. He can't do that if we say she just helped him and rescued him. You know, it doesn't have that connotation of it's your fault. My first book, Getting Them Sober, Volume 1, has sold a million copies by word of mouth. No publicity, no promotion, because it's got hundreds and hundreds of practical, doable suggestions that are easy, that are gentle, that the family can do, and it changes everything in the house so he has a much better chance to get sober, to choose sobriety. The gettingthemsober.com website has 100 plus recovery tips of the month to read free and to print out and use all you want in teaching, whatever. Um, it has a discussion bulletin board that's monitored for safety 24-7 so families don't get trashed. Um, it has articles, uh, how to know if he's serious about getting sober when he says he wants to get sober, what happens if alcoholics stop going to AA. All that stuff is on the website and it's free for everyone. For many years the media, meaning well but didn't know, depicted alcoholics and drug addicts as like, you know, they're in the gutter. Where 97% of them are your neighbors, the judges, the doctors, the lawyers, you know. The people you're married to, the media is starting to realistically portray average people as alcoholics and drug addicts. It's not just your movie stars. And that makes it so much easier for people to say, oh yeah, yeah, my husband's a, an engineer and they're showing engineers who have a problem, okay? And who are well-functioning. Like he can't be because he's well-functioning and he just got a promotion and a raise. But they don't see the progression of the disease is gonna take him down. I think there is so much hope, you know, Unfortunately, the really terrible stories, they draw more ratings. <laughs> so people don't want to report on that, and I understand that. They want to get viewers, of course. But the, the real hope is in what I call, what we, used to, what we used to call the silent majority. That's the people who get help, go about their lives, rebuild their families. That's the majority of people who go for help. Doug, what is media literacy? Media literacy is the ability to understand the messages and the media that, are, uh, that one is exposed to and to realize what's being communicated, interpret uh, the messages, and be able to act on them appropriately. Uh, don't get fooled. Um, uh, understand uh, you know, what the content is and um, uh, be able to confidently interpret it and, and integrate it into your life, into your worldview. And Mark, why should people need to react if they see a, an incorrect portrayal of addiction, treatment, or behavioral health issues on any media? Well, one of the key things that we've talked about here today is, is having the level of awareness and understanding so that if you see something that does not seem to be right, check it out. What's the source? What, why are they trying to convey that message to you? That ultimately gets to... You know, if, if the in incentive behind the person sending the message is not necessarily in your best interest, why are you paying attention to them? It gets to the ultimate profit motive of our media as well. That's why it's important to them in the long run to be sending accurate messages about addiction and recovery so that the public gets a better sense of what is going on, how it's portrayed, and, and ultimately, you know, have the opportunity to seek help if they need it themselves to help someone they know get treatment or get into some kind of counseling or support early on. And, and one of the great things about the media and why it's such a critical partner is, is people are inviting them, inviting the media into their homes. Unlike when we do brochures or pamphlets, you know, we're out there knocking on doors trying to get people to take this stuff. These, these storylines and, and the music and the videos and the, the online, people are welcoming 
this into their home. They're, they're proactively seeking this information. And what a great opportunity to convey accurate information that is helpful and healthy to those who are watching. Ron, if people see this misinformation, what should they do? I don't know if they know if they're seeing misinformation. That's the problem, I think. I think they've seen the portrayal since the beginning that it's being portrayed, uh, and they see the train wreck, like everybody says, and um, they don't know, and that goes to a certain point, and they show someone maybe going to an AA or an NA meeting and picking up a white chip, and they don't pursue the journey after that. You never see uh, the spiritual side of recovery on what this disease is really about. So I would suggest that they sort of weigh it in their own mind and pick up the phone. And there are organizations, uh, AA and NA, and, uh, that, that will portray the correct message. And Faces and Voices for Recovery certainly gets engaged in... Faces in and Voices of Recovery are fantastic people. Um, they're part of our community, and uh, they do only good for the world. I mean, it, it's an incredible organization. But it really does take that, does it not? It takes people getting engaged, getting involved, calling individuals, letting them know that they're not quite comfortable the way that things are, have been portrayed. Because stigma really it, it is totally perpetuated in, in many instances through bad portrayals. Yes. I mean, one of the things we, we know about good, compelling storylines is that it triggers the behaviors of, for example, talking with family members and friends about what they've seen, calling for further information. You know, we've done studies to look at uh, searches on the web um, and the timing of those searches. What we found is people are multitasking. If there's a great storyline on television that's, that's engrossing them, they will actually do a web search between the 9 and 10 p.m. hour when that show is on the air. They're not waiting till the end. So they've got sort of this multimedia thing going on. So we can't underestimate the power of TV storylines to actually trigger behavior. And one thing we know from other research is that when you make something a household word, it's a predictor of behavior change. It's an indicator that change will come. So making it a household word means that people actually break that stigma and taboo and talk about addiction, treatment, and recovery. In a good way. In a good way. Right, Doug? I, I think one of the key themes that we've been all touching on in this discussion is the notion of authenticity. I think one of the things that Ron pointed out is that, that portrayals of recovery in the media are not necessarily as authentic as they can be, mm -hmm. and that when portrayals are authentic and they're engaging, uh, they bring people in. Uh, and they make them want to learn more uh, and be part of the solution, uh, not simply watching the train wreck and, and getting satisfaction out of that. I think we need to figure out how to frame uh, messages about recovery and integrate authentic depictions of recovery into programming. And Recovery Month really tries to do that. I think Recovery Month, uh, not only through this show, we, we feature Voices for Recovery through this show. And it really, it, it's fascinating because people don't just sugarcoat it. They say, you know, this is, this is the trajectory of what I went through, and this is where I am right now. Correct, Ron? I know that you've, we've, we've shot you. and Yeah, definitely. It's, it has to be realistic. And, um, but I think this is about the recovery community as a whole, is we're trying to put a positive face on recovery, not a negative face on addiction. And there's a big difference between addiction and recovery, and to portray addiction is necessary. But it's also more necessary to portray a correct ca event on how recovery is in people's lives. And that's what I talked about the anonymity issue is we need more people successful people in recovery standing up and saying, I'm in recovery and I'm proud of it. What about the family and friends of people in recovery? They're in recovery too, right? Definitely. So Recovery Month isn't just about the addict or the alcoholic, it's also about people who've been impacted by alcoholism or drug addiction. It's really everyone that's, that is affected by this issue that needs to really get engaged with the media or online and really have a voice, correct, Doug? Yeah, I think social support is obviously part of what we're talking about here. I mean, you know, we know from studies of, of uh, 
lots of uh, public health programs that w delivering a message in one way through one channel is a lot less likely to work than if we surround the individual with messages. So they're getting it through the media, they're getting it through programs, they're getting it through social support. That's all part of the solution. And we're much more likely to be successful in changing the way we think about recovery and having more people in recovery if we fo focus on multifaceted programs that include social support. The whole notion of education, outreach, uh, resilience mm -hmm. in, in recovery also needs to be, to be portrayed. How can people really, I want to go back to what people can actually do. Should they be calling their television stations? Should they be calling the producers? Should they be advocating, you know, for this to happen, Mark? Well, I think every individual has a responsibility to take action when they see something is inaccurate, wrong, and, and there's many ways you can do that. And there are constructive ways and there are not so productive ways. So picking up the phone as an individual such as yourself and saying, you know, I don't like the way that was on the show. Let's talk to you about recovery. Why don't you come to one of our meetings? And, 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 and quite frankly, you'll have an opportunity to educate someone and, and maybe convert one more person, one person at a time. And, and the media, again, is so critical because our families and kids and are inviting the messages into their homes. When they see something that says, you know, that looks like me, that looks like what I'm going through. It, it's very accurate, it's very close to what I'm experiencing. And then we've been great enough to work with a group like Hollywood Health and Society and build a message in where you can call to get help. And that's where you see the spikes in the calls and you see the people going online. So, so everyone has a responsibility to bring the resources they have access to to bear. You know, at SAMHSA, we work with the writers through organizations to provide science so information is accurate. The writers tell it in a compelling way. Mm -hmm. And so we all have our place and responsibility. And there's no better way to talk about recovery than by observing National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month in September. And we call on you not only to become active viewers uh, and media literate, uh, but also to get engaged and get your family involved in National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month. Thank you for being here. Great show. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of alcohol and drug use disorders and highlight the effectiveness of treatment. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the Free Recovery Month Kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning organizing and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to addiction treatment and recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP. It's important that everyone become involved because addiction is our nation's number one health problem and treatment is our best tool to address it. Mm -hmm.